It is my distinct pleasure to present this award this year to Dr. Peter Gay. Dr. Gay is a professor of medicine at the Mayo Medical School and has been a senior faculty member at Mayo Clinic for decades. Dr. Gay has devoted his career to research and clinical care support of patients with neuromuscular disorders and chronic respiratory failure, and he is internationally recognized for his contributions to the specialty. His commendable involvement with CHEST over the years includes roles as a past president of the National Association of Medical Directors for Respiratory Care, otherwise known as NAMDARC, chair of the Home-Based Mechanical Ventilation and Neuromuscular Disease Network within CHEST, and a delegate to the Sleep Institute and Council on Critical Care. Dr. Gay has also directed and participated in CHEST, SEEK, and other society sleep board preparation courses, and he provides guidance on the development of CMS coverage criteria for neuromuscular diseases and home mechanical ventilation. For his dedication to patient care, research, and the advancement of the specialty, we honor his work today. Peter, we look forward to listening to your presentation today as the 2020 Margaret Frommer Memorial Lecturer. Well, thank you, Clay. Um, let me get my presentation set up here and share my screen. Let's go here and there. And we're off. Well, it is truly an honor to be the Margaret Frommer Endowed Memorial uh, lecture in home-based mechanical ventilation for 2020. And I'd like to take you on a cruise uh, to navigate how uh, we got to a place uh, for non-invasive ventilation for uh, home patients, the home NIV nirvana, as I call it. And I want you to keep in mind as a theme here, what Margaret would do throughout these time, uh, these adverse times that she faced throughout her life. I had the pleasure of meeting Alan Goldberg uh, at a meeting we had together in Turkey. And he told me a story of this remarkable woman. And it was in fact, I think around 1999, he was president and he had felt it very important to get this lecture off the ground. And she had died just that year before. And he was telling me how in the early years it was a struggle, but uh, it becomes so important to him that is now a, a longstanding tradition that I'm happy to be part of. As far as a conflict of interest, uh, sadly, I have none, but I'm certainly open to discussion if anybody has a suggestion for me. Um, I want you to look at the past awardees of the Margaret Frommer Endowed Memorial Lecture. And this is truly a collection of good fellas and good gals. Uh, I was reminded of this movie where Joe Pesci uh, announces to the, the group that he's actually been made when he's been recognized by this group. And I now feel part of the the Margaret Mafia, as you look at this distinguished group, and, and you can truly feel honored when you see these names behind you. So again, uh, I, I thank the, uh, the college for this remarkable uh, uh, presence among these people. I wanna tell you about this uh, Margaret Carol Frommer, who uh, was really uh, on her way to DePaul University in 1956 when she contracted terrible bulbar spinal paralytic polio. Terrible thing about that, it was just a few years before the vaccine and in that epidemic, uh, she was actually left quadriplegic and in an iron lung for a period of time to the point when she came out, she could just about move her head. And of course she had to move in with her parents who unfortunately died and then they just moved Margaret off to a nursing home. But this was a bright woman and she began to wonder right away what would Margaret do if she had to get out of here? Well, with aggressive rehab at Northwestern uh, Hospital, uh, she was so inspiring to all the people there. She became a volunteer in the research uh, area of the hospital. She actually joined the staff in 73 in the prosthetics research laboratory and worked with the engineers there. She was actually the receptionist, but she wanted more. She pondered again, what would Margaret do? She guided designs and development of these devices for the handicap. 
And the sipping and puffing straw method that allowed her to operate a computer and even operate her wheelchair, she was one of the first to actually leave the community, leave her home and, and go into the community with a wheelchair. Um, and then she began to focus on consumer advocacy. She actually gained national attention and gave congressional testimony, consulted with federal agencies, but her main goal was to help disabled persons get more out of life with the technology and technical aids that were available to enhance their status in society, create new opportunities. So especially in this COVID era, I want you to think about the amazing accomplishments that came to her despite enormous personal obstacles. So when faced with your own seemingly insurmountable tasks, ask yourself, what would Margaret do? I'm reminded of this quote uh, that I was told about. I do not mind failure. However, I do mind going through life without having tried. So my objectives with this talk is to provide a historical perspective of the journey through home non-invasive mechanical ventilation. And now it has shaped where we are today. Really this pathway has determined the treatment plans that we face every day. And unfortunately, how coverage policy has actually shaped the practice rather than the other way around. And guided by that call to arms where this coverage policy is really now interfering with practice, I started to ponder, what would Margaret do? Well, my most important objective at 7.30 in the morning is that, that you just enjoy the next 40, 45 minutes. So I went back and looked at the history of non-invasive ventilation. This is what I first came up with. This is pretty remarkable. Um, the earliest use of positive pressure that I could find was actually in congestive heart failure patients in a publication in the Lancet in 1936, where it was delivered through a vacuum cleaner exhaust. And they warned you to clean out the bag before you put it on any patients. And positive pressure respiration actually followed with contraptions of various kinds to further treat acute pulmonary edema. There were publications in the 30s. Intermittent positive pressure ventilation became popular for hospitalized patients. I know we prescribed it for every orthopedic patient post-operatively, and there was actually no benefit over a simple nebulizer when we looked at COPD patients in the 80s. But I look back and I think the French really deserve credit for the use of a mask attached to a ventilator in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and Rudeau was actually part of Dominic Robert's group, um, published an abstract for uh, actually a Japanese conference. And having published only the abstract and not the paper, I don't think he ever got credit for actually being the first to do this. Well, this was actually the form of non-invasive ventilation that Margaret was part of when she was in the iron lung for many months. And here was the portable version of what was used in the way past uh, you can see this model uh, who's using this in the home, but obviously this contraption was not something you took to the grocery store. And early approaches to sleep disorder breathing were out there. It kind of looks like a COVID mask now, but uh, I'm sure some uh, folks would love to get a hold of one of these things that you could use to silence him, the amazing snore mute jaw muzzle. Well, the actual first CPAP came about because the Germans realized in patients that they were watching watching asphyxiate themselves with terrible upper airway obstruction, which was really obstructive sleep apnea, went away with a tracheostomy. And it was really Colin Sullivan who first described CPAP, and he published this in The Lancet in 1981. Dave Rappaport in the United States was actually just months behind him, but un unfortunately he didn't publish this as soon as Colin did, and he got all the credit. But you can see him with this custom-made mask over one of his uh, mates that he had uh, actually recruited out of the pub in, uh, in Australia where they had uh, had a tendency to get into these foster lager oil can beer size uh, drinks there. He seen them asleep and choking in the bar and he got this idea to use this machine to blow air through the nose. You can see the machine under his left arm there and he said the pump was so powerful it could run a swimming pool and it was surrounded like and it sounded like a freight train in a tunnel, but he did get this thing to work at night and these patients to breathe. Well, technology moved forward and I'm not quite sure why this didn't catch on. CPUP is out there for some of you and I don't, 
think this is a better example of the dog wagging the tail, but I haven't seen it catch on commercially just yet. What went on in the past was an effort to relax the diaphragm in patients that were thought to have exhausted respiratory muscles, particularly in COPD. And it was probably Dudley Rochester in 1977, who in fact used an iron lung. And with EMG, he showed he could actually quiet the diaphragm completely by supporting patients with assisted breathing devices like an iron lung. Taking this to heart and thinking, gosh, if we rested people at night, the McGill group in Montreal said, let's do a randomized trial and put patients in a non invasive ventilatory device, in this case, the poncho wrap, and see if we can reduce their CO2. Well, this big trial in 1984 actually had only 40 patients finish. And you can imagine it wasn't quite that easy to sleep in this contraption called the poncho wrap. So we actually had to study them only during the day. And it was kind of a bust. Well, was that a problem with the idea or a problem with the device? In 1990, Mark Sanders was working on a device called what he said was a BiPAP. It was a bi-level device where he noticed that it, particularly in his patients with obesity hypoventilation, that if you look at this flow curve here, you could see that flow limitation there. Say aroused, you could see the full flow profile. But in fact, with just a high pressure, 10 to 12 centimeters of water CPAP, he couldn't obliterate that. They still had a high resistance to the upper airway. And he realized with just a delta, an inspiratory pressure that went five centimeters of water higher than that, he could actually obliterate that flow limitation. And hence was born nasal BiPAP. Well, this was the first patient I actually did in 1989. This was a portable uh, ventilator that I attached to a intermittent positive vent positive pressure ventilation mask. You could see we were just using rubber band contraptions. And this patient came in with some type of neuromuscular disease not known just yet. And we uh, uh, were called when they knew we were just starting this. And I remember the resident asking me, uh, what might we do with this patient? And I asked him what was going on with the blood gas. And he said, oh, he came in with a blood gas of a PO2 of 54 and a PCO2 of 54. And we put him on oxygen, but now he's really sleepy. And I said, you better get a blood gas right now. And indeed his PCO2 is now a hundred and he'd become a member of what we call the Century Club now where their CO2s were a hundred. We came very aware of the danger of oxygen and neuromuscular disease. And we were able to actually send this contraption home. This was a little before BiPAP uh, was more regularly available, but in fact, he was able to sleep with us during the night and he lived a few years more with what turned out to be ALS. Well, it was about time for the science to catch up for the empiric efforts we were making and really band-aids, erector sets and masking, masking tape. So we took these bi-level devices and we actually submitted patients in a randomized controlled trial to benefits to these devices, asking the question, particularly for the COPD patient with hypercapnia, could we improve their life situation and particularly their hypercapnia? Well, Nick Hill and his group in Rhode Island, us here at uh, Mayo, and actually Meacham Jones in England went at this in the mid 90s. And this eventually showed benefit only in this population. There were very few studies. There was a small study that was actually retrospective. Mark Elliott also in England showed you could drop that CO2 and then in the randomized controlled trial, a bigger trial of 18 patients, this actually worked. So people became very enthusiastic about this and it really took off. So that if in fact you added this, he called it uh, pressure support ventilation, non-invasive pressure support ventilation with oxygen, over oxygen with hypercapnic COPD, their daytime blood gases got better, their sleep, their quality of life, in these staple hypercapnic COPD patients. So this was in the era in mid nineties where oxygen was being cut and many physicians were actually being solicited to put these on. And it just took off to the point that Medicare became absolutely frightened that every COPD patient would be placed on a BiPAP and almost bankrupt the Medicare system. 
So faced with this adversity, Medicare decided, maybe we should just shut this down. But if you were in Margaret's shoes, you would ask, what should we do about this? Well, she would obviously say, put together a Cracker Jack consensus conference and try to make sense out of this. So that's what we did. With NANDARC, we had a consensus conference in February of 1998 that actually tried to develop clinical indications. And this was actually published in CHEST in 1999 and formed the basis for the next two and a half decades for how we use non-invasive ventilation. This was a unique format. We actually had CMS people there with the very limited evidence-based uh, medicine we had the Meacham-Jones trial for hypercapnic COPD, and we had some pretty strong evidence in neuromuscular disease that it was beneficial. But as a result of this, reimbursement was then decided for these particular groups of patients, and they were very strict. And this really set the foundation for a dangerous precedent for durable medical equipment in non-invasive ventilation for the next two decades. In order to get what you wanted, you had to know the playbook from the reimbursement guidelines in order to get what you needed for your patients. Well, after that, the technology came out. We had APAP, we had BPAP, we had Elemental PPAP. You could have AFLEX, BIFLEX, you could take a little bit off the top, you could take a little bit off the bottom, but the technology just took off to the point that now instead of CPAP, PAP, the tail was wagging the dog here. Now you could observe your patients. So by 2006, we could watch every night what they were doing to try and enhance their use of their PAP equipment. And then in studies, we started to say, well, does this really make a difference? We actually had a randomized tr trial with Bob Ballard out in Colorado, Pat Strollo in Pittsburgh, where we did show benefit in patients who were resisting CPAP that a bi-level device might enhance their nighttime use. So the science just now starting to catch up with this, but look at this, we're now seven, eight years um, after Mark had, uh, 17 years after Mark had announced the BiPAP that the science was actually catching up with the technology. Now we had AVAPs, the average volume assured pressure support ventilation for obesity hypoventilation and a few, uh, retrospective trials showing, yeah, we could drop the transcutaneous CO2 at night, and maybe this would be beneficial theoretically. But again, these devices were already approved. They were out there. People were using this. These were expensive devices and the exact indications. And then the coverage for these was all over the place. So it was difficult to prescribe for your patients, even though you thought from this data, your patients, especially with obesity hypoventilation, might benefit from this. The reimbursement criteria were so strict, you could not order it routinely for your obesity hypoventilation patient. Well, uh, Tim Morgenthaler and I and Lee Brown out of New Mexico then were enchanted with this new device called the adaptive servo ventilator. And in patients with chain stokes respiration who weren't responding to CPAP, we felt would do well with the adaptive servo ventilator. And we then became aware of the patients with complex sleep apnea who when given CPAP developed centrals and actually did badly on CPAP. They also did well with that. And we confirmed our hypothesis that now this very expensive and uh, very uh, complex device that auto servoed in response breath to breath to these patients and showed improvements in their apnea hypopnea index. So it received approval in the United States but there was no coverage in the USA. Well, faced with these machines taking off in the budget, CMS began to imagine ways that they could curb some of these pay payments. And they developed a two-tiered system where if it was a ventilator device, it required frequent and substantial payment, which meant it paid for this device for life. So if you figured out a way to get a device, was recognized as a ventilator. And in fact, Medicare had to pay a monthly payment for this for a lifetime. It also came with services. Well, they got clever about this and they decided, especially the ST devices or the BiPAPs with a backup rate, which were truly forms of ventilators. And in fact, the FDA called it a ventilator and CMS said, 
Just because FDA calls it a ventilator doesn't mean it's a ventilator. We're gonna call it a RAD. Let's call it a respiratory assist device. Let's take it out of that category and then let's just pay for it for 13 months and we'll justify it on the basis of the Deficit Reduction Act. So in fact, they took services away and then they changed the payment system for that. So they were always seemingly one step ahead of us in uh, making sure that the payment system curbed the actual prescriptions by physicians for their patients. Competitive bidding comes along as part of the budget, Balanced Budget Act. So Cong Congress mandates competitive bidding for durable medical equipment the following year. So they publish these rules that outline an intent to the agency uh, to use this competitive bidding method, which usually drove the prices down to the bottom and left many of these policies unanswered. Now, once the payment is given, the actual amount becomes much less. So there were many people concerned about this. Uh, would it limit the availability of new technologies with the payments going down? Now, obviously in this capped rental category, the servicing for the equipment disappeared. There was no frequent and substantial servicing component. So there was no respiratory therapy support for your ALS patients, your neuromuscular disease. And these new patients were forced into a delivery system with no choice. The guy who won the bid was the guy who delivered it. And oftentimes to the door, this drop shipping technique, the Amazon delivery of your non-invasive ventilatory device could take place. Well, this is actually from the international hotel uh, pamphlet that you'll get, that if you do set yourself on fire, don't run. Well, we didn't want to run from this situation. We again thought we should attack this head on and ask Margaret, what would Margaret do? Well, maybe you have to sit down and renegotiate these criteria and try to get something back for your patients. So that's what we did. So we renegotiated the categories. The neuromuscular disease stayed the same in the thoracic restrictive category. Severe COPD with hypercapnia still had access to a bi-level device. Central sleep apnea was cleaned up. I'll tell you about the details in a minute. We had a hypoventilation syndrome to try and help some of the obesity hypoventilation syndrome and move the obstructive sleep apnea patient that was trying to get used to CPAP but then did better with a bi-level device that moved to another coverage determination category. So the good news, CMS left the non-invasive positive pressure for neuromuscular disease, COPD, and OSA patients unchanged where it was favorable for us. And we were actually able to get complex apnea syndromes recognized to the point that, in fact, this was one of the most favorable ways for us to get an adaptive servo ventilator to patients. And this worked quite well. And what we thought was peculiar, but a very great advantage to us, they paid no attention to home mechanical ventilation for non-invasive ventilation, which left us an out to deliver devices to patients who couldn't get to bi-level devices easily. The bad news is the problem was with the backup rate for COPD and obesity hypoventilation. There were these incredibly difficult rules that you had to hire a lawyer or you had a special person in your division that had to know all the rules. And if you were lucky enough to be me, you got a lot of phone calls because nobody else wanted to learn these things. We still had oximetry criteria for COPD. CMS had thought that the non-invasive ventilation was designed to replace oxygen for COPD. We we're trying to convince them no, they don't have to be hypoxic. They need to be hypercapnic. This is a ventilatory problem, not an oxygen problem. And they had to demand that oxygen be placed on a COPD patient first, which would of course drive their hypercapnia up. But if their oximetry was all right on that oxygen, even though their CO2 went up, they couldn't get a device. So they changed the backup rate reimbursement category, as you know, to the frequent and substantial servicing and the capped rental on top of making it difficult to get the backup rate, this was still a problem. But we considered it somewhat of a Pyrrhic victory because we still had the home mechanical ventilator as a backup. 
Well, the science crawled on. And as we went on through the years here, as you see, the actual randomized controlled trials began to notice something. You notice here the peak airway pressure being used tended to be most beneficial in those who used a higher pressure. As you can see, being prone to the kinder and gentler way, I used one of the lowest pressures, and this wasn't a very positive result, but it at least got that out of the way. So that through the years, more and more pressure being used produced more and more positive results. Through this, now more important trials, much bigger trials, began to look at this different approaches to how to deliver beneficial treatment to patients with COPD. This was the Sentinel randomized controlled trial in non-invasive positive pressure ventilations in patients with COPD. We called it hot, high intensity positive pressure. It required a backup rate in high minute ventilation. But if you took a severe COPD patient with a resting PCO2 of 52, and then you targeted this high, high minute ventilation to the highest level that they could tolerate and try to dry their PACO2 sometimes near normal, these patients had a remarkable change in their outcome. Not just improvement in some quality of life, some sleep quality, some improvement in their CO2 level. These people lived longer. This was a remarkable improvement in their survival. Step back cardiologist, no cardiologic trial you can show me had anywhere near this improvement in survival. The one year all cause mortality for the patients in the non invasive positive ventilation group compared to the controls on oxygen alone was three times as bad. And the ones that did utilize this device had a remarkable improvement in mortality. The companion study that came out with the British a couple of years later did essentially the same thing, taking patients who were hypercapnic, a group of about 60 patients, either on oxygen or on this hot, high intensity positive pressure ventilation. I'm sorry, they had 116 patients in uh, the group. So indeed, um, the comparison there, once again, didn't just show we improved their CO2, didn't just improve show we improved their quality of life, but this had an additional benefit. This showed admission-free and survival benefit. So not only did we prevent death, we kept them out of the hospital. If you keep them out of the hospital, you can imagine the benefit for the readmission criteria penalty that might come if CMS decided to penalize you for readmission. Hmm. Where have you heard that? So now we have two randomized controlled trials. I'll remind you the first one is in 2014 and then the next one is in 2017. We renegotiated those criteria in 2010. There still is not an easy way to get to a backup rate. So even though this is very strong evidence that the way to do this is with high intensity ventilation, you can't have a device that does this in the United States. The Europeans, particularly the British, can't understand how a reimbursement system can tell you not to follow the science. They looked at us askance. It was pretty clear you should use non-invasive ventilation for COPD or you were gonna die. Along with this, people had started to produce practice guidelines that recognize, well, some people, particularly with obesity hypoventilation, who just had coexistent severe obstructive sleep apnea, could use CPAP, but particularly for those patients who came in with right-sided heart failure, who were very sick, that had obesity hypoventilation as well, in fact, needed a device just to get out of the hospital. Babic Moklisi, who headed this American Thoracic Society panel in his Chicago population, needed to find a way to get these patients out of the hospital. He didn't have access to sending them across the street to the University of Chicago and get them a sleep study. 
And oftentimes it took a few months to get them back for proper titration in a laboratory and diagnostic criteria. So there was the strong recommendation that these patients deserve to have their treatment provided to them as an outpatient beginning from their inpatient hospitalization. So this was actually a, a clinical practice guideline. Could you do this with a bi-level device with a backup rate with a current reimbursement criteria for Medicare? No way. So he'd shown that there really was need for a paradigm shift in our approach. The so-called EO471, this is more of the numbers and alphabet uh, designations of these devices. But an EO471 was a bi-level device with a backup rate. Patients with hypoventilation syndromes needed this. The current evidence showed that for patients who had survived a hospitalization, their outcomes, their outcomes were improved when they were discharged home with bi-level devices with a backup rate. Ambulatory patients, in fact, with obesity hypoventilation, if they were given a backup rate, you could improve their ventilation. Well, now comes the effort by Medicare to improve quality of care. And one of the focuses as the cardiologists know for heart failure and pulmonologists know all too well for COPD exacerbation, no matter whether your patient is following your recommendations or not, if they're readmitted, the hospital gets nothing. Physician may still get paid for their visits, but the hospital takes a big hit for this and you get nothing for their readmission. So efforts were being made to try and find a way to keep patients out of the hospital. I'm sure all of you had some kind of technique where you had nurses, respiratory therapists, somebody working on getting patients to be adherent to their therapies, but it became clear, particularly for the patients with hypercapnia, that they would benefit from non-invasive ventilation, particularly with this high intensity approach. Could you give them a bi-level device to keep them out of the hospital, knowing that they needed a backup rate? No. Physicians said, maybe there's a way out of this. To avoid keeping them from bouncing back into the hospital, we could use the alternative approach where we'll, we'll order the more expensive home ventilators, so-called trilogies or astral devices known to uh, pulmonologists, were actually the ventilators. They were left, remember, in the frequented substantial servicing category. So you still got a respiratory therapist with this. And what angered Medicare to no end was that, remember, these are paid for life. They got monthly payment, not for 13 months. It wasn't a cap rental. This kept payment going for life. So now if you needed to keep your obesity hypoventilator, your COPD patients, huh, they had chronic respiratory failure, you could prescribe with a pen, chronic respiratory failure in need of home mechanical ventilation. That was the criteria to get one of these expensive devices. Much easier than a bi-level device with a backup rate. Well, why do you need so many of these widgets? We really didn't know who needed home mechanical ventilation to ventilate. Is it when a respiratory assist device fails? Do you actually really need more horsepower? These, these rads could deliver tremendous horsepower. And the special features of the home mechanical ventilation were sometimes needed. Neuromuscular disease patients could use a mouthpiece to assist them during the day, yet battery backup and alarms in these devices. These newer HMVs actually could deliver rad type BiPAP settings. They had a BiPAP mode, further confusing the reimbursement for this, which was designed around the device rather than the treatment plan. And you couldn't tell the difference really from the settings of a RAD and an HMV. But like an HMV and a respiratory assist with a backup rate, this is a classic Medicare situation. It's easier to get a motorized scooter for your patient than a standardized wheelchair. So we would prescribe a ventilator. So what happened? What before was ventilation devices going to neuromuscular disease in 2009, Remember, this is about the time that the uh, penalty for COPD exacerbation readmission was coming in. 
by five years later, this had shifted. All of this chronic respiratory failure was really COPD. Now neuromuscular disease was the much smaller portion. But this is what really happened. The durable medical equipment, uh, medical administrative carriers, particularly Region C in the South Atlantic, this was uh, one of the physicians who was controlling the non-invasive ventilator support and scrutinizing this. Five million outlay in 2002. Hmm, double in 2011. Uh-oh, double again in 2012. 2013, 181 million from 5 million five years before. Uh uh, Medicare isn't going to let that go. Now they're going to fire with both barrels. So in 2015, they say, we're going to note that ventilators, because you're really using them like respiratory assist devices, will be denied as not reasonable and necessary for non-invasive ventilation. And they relied on an old coverage and analysis decision from 2001 that utilized this clause that distinguished ventilation in a patient for whom interruption or failure of respiratory support leads to death as the only indication for a home mechanical ventilation non-invasively. So only thing you're gonna get is a rad. So even neuromuscular patients who are needing this for hours during the day were in danger of losing this. So we started again with now years of effort to change this national coverage decision. Multiple societies came together to try and get CMS to create a formal reconsideration of the NCD, the home mechanical ventilation and RAD criteria. Well, we wrote this paper in a month. Several of the experts got together from many societies, CHEST, NAMDARC, and we had our paper ready in a month. They took the full 180 days, six months after receiving this paper that they in fact requested. And at the end of that, on the uh, six month uh, deadline, they replied, this is a complex issue. And there are several related policies, national and local, yaddy, 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 we're not going to reconsider this. Disastrous after all this effort, very disappointing to do all this work and just be told, bye. So for the next two years, the only alternative we had was to go to the Hill. So if you have to now go to your senators and your Congress uh, persons to get legislative action, that takes years. Well, we made some traction there. But mind you, all this time, patients with hypercapnic COPD aren't getting bi levels with a backup rate. They're not getting home mechanical ventilation. And now, just to give it to you one more time, CMS says we're going to put home mechanical ventilation into competitive bidding. So now we'll have another race for the bottom that if you manage to get one of these things for your patients, now it's going to be in the competitive bidding category. So we again banded together. We went to the Hill to try and introduce legislation to exempt non-invasive ventilation from competitive bidding. And we got some traction from Congress to say, look, CMS admits they don't understand this. You've got a family practitioner, you got a urologist, they don't understand this stuff. So ultimately, why don't you get a technical expert panel together? Maybe that'll work. And there was a recommendation urging establishment of this. Well, when you urge establishment, it doesn't mean you get one. Well, once again, what would Margaret do? Well, it's time for a real technical expert panel. They actually went forth with the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality put together this te technical assessment program that actually looked at the evidence for hypercapnic COPD. It was now really obvious that with this strong evidence, these patients were being denied. So CMS said, well, we at least have to address this group. And they put together a group for the Medical Evidence Development Coverage and Advisory Committee that said, we're going to address a special meeting which came together in July 22nd of 2020 that I was fortunate to be part of as one of the panelists. But again, they were, just, they were going to look at the patient selection criteria, parameters of the services needed and the equipment for just hypercapnic COPD. Well, along this time, of course, COVID is changing the world. 
amazingly, CMS backs off. They say, well, wait a minute. We can't now have competitive bidding for ventilators, the precious ventilators needed by these COVID patients. And sadly, the epidemic pandemic turned out to be an advantage for our situation. It put the brakes on this runaway attack of home mechanical ventilation. So we did have that virtual meeting. And fortunately, there was an outcry by the experts that said, look, this is, this is foul. This is another Band-Aid to try and fix the national coverage determination. When we had this backup pay, uh, rate problem for obesity hypoventilation, as well as COPD, can we fix the whole problem? So CMS, a month later, with some telephone conversations that we had, said, all right, well, if you guys get this together, maybe with an expert panel that you can organize, we can make some better recommendations to CMS to finally completely revamp this. And they agreed to actually participate if CHEST would host this with multi-society input. So we, in fact, organized in a month, in five weeks, the uh, optimal non-invasive Medicare access proposal with a technical expert panel. And this was amazing. I'm sure uh, spouses thought of death threats for me when I asked them to give up a weekend five weeks later and all meet for that entire weekend. And Bob Owens and I chaired a group of 25 of the USA's finest. Now it's pretty hard when you get a technical expert panel of this stature to ignore them. So we really thought we had the attention of CMS and we really knew we were not gonna reduplicate these efforts again and bang our heads against the wall and end up like this. So we wanted to share our patient's pain point, propose a better diagnostic and clinical coverage pathway. We also had to address the compliance and auditor problems where it became a game of, well, if they didn't use it enough or they didn't meet these criteria, it was a game of gotcha. We're gonna stop payment and take this away. That was really a venture that was not good for our parents. So our goals were, we had a mantra, let's get the right device to the right patient with consideration for the right cost, but simplification was beautification. We could not perpetuate these rules that so few people understood that they always messed up the documentation. So we broke up these individual RAD categories, the neuromuscular disease, the COPD, et cetera. And each of these groups looked at the current problems and came up with preliminary solutions and had subsequent discussions to, after exchanging suggestions to come up with this summary report. And our group owes this society and our patients, a publication that will be peer reviewed and then ultimately submitted to CMS with the appendix stating our consensus approval for this optimal management process for our patients with an expected subsequent formal national coverage decision process and ultimately final CMS approval. We need to get this done right and we will. What I was reminded of was a quote from Winston Churchill says that you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. But what has Margaret taught me to do? Well, she's taught me to make all efforts to remove regulatory barriers to optimal care. And that coverage criteria and reimbursement must not guide practice. It must be practice that guides coverage criteria. We must ask for all that's reasonable and necessary for our patients. So I think if we go forth with this, we can change this sad picture into a masterpiece. So with that, I'll turn it back over to my uh, moderator. And again, thank you for this award. It is most humbling and I really appreciate this. So I'll stop sharing my screen and go for it. Dr. Pisani. You're muted. <laughs> I thought I unmuted. Um, thank you. That was amazing. I didn't know anything about this whole history. And so I learned a ton. Um, I'm going to ask the audience if they have any questions um, to type them in the question and answer um, on the right side of your screen. Um, and we can address them to Dr. Gay. Um, in the meantime, 
it seems like you're, this is just so ongoing and uh, moving forward. And so where are, you, where are you at right now? I mean, it looks like those slides you had up were just two, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, ultimately, we're still sleepless, uh, well, now in Rochester for me, but ultimately, uh, we have a draft due for the entire group November 9th. Uh, obviously, with the frenzy of the election, uh, there's some complications here. But remember, we're talking to uh, career bureaucrats. Whoever wins the election, these people will still be there. And when you put 25 of the USA's finest together, it's really hard to deny what we're going to offer them. We're going to do their work for them. We're going to simplify things. And I, I find it difficult to believe, especially in this COVID era, where pulmonologists, sleep doctors have all this new respect. We have to capture this. Um, some of the questions from the audience, the first one from Dr. Cowell, can you comment on the entire concept of competitive bidding and how it affects approval process for devices and also supplemental oxygen delivery? He, he's asking me many questions at once, but let, let me give you a perspective here because what happened with competitive bidding in the oxygen arena is precisely why we're so frightened in our arena. It virtually ended liquid oxygen for patients because it just wasn't financially feasible that you had to pay somebody to deliver this stuff. And uh, ultimately liquid oxygen is almost unheard of now for our patients. We can't have a race for the bottom in competitive bidding so that the final bid actually is a bankrupting uh, amount for a company that can only deliver bad service or stop delivery of something. This has to end. And in fact, CMS heard us. They said, all right, we're gonna take the average of all of these bid. And even if you were the bottom bidder, we're gonna take what happened in the middle of this. So you actually don't have to bankrupt yourself to win that bid. All right, the, the questions are flying in. Um, where does AVAPS fall into the Medicare conversation? Well, ultimately, if we succeed in our effort of, look, what's complicated life? You've got this widget, to get to this widget, you need this criteria, and this criteria isn't consistent with clinical practice at all. Why not eliminate that aspect of this? So an AVAPS, a bi-level device with a backup rate, that's an automatic now for the obesity hypoventilation. It's an automatic for COPD hypercapnia. You do not have the complication of a barrier to clinical practice that's now the standard of care to use this device. So we are going to ease the burden on Medicare to simply remove that criteria. That's the hope that AVAPS would now be just as accessible as a bi-level device for the backup rate for COPD. All right. Um, how about how will monitoring change home non-invasive? How will remote monitoring change home non-invasive ventilation? A million dollar question. Now, if CMS realizes what the advantage of virtual encounters with patients has done for care in the COVID era and perpetuates this, this will be a paradigm shift in follow-up care, not just for our patients but I think for all kinds of other patients. Now there's rumblings, the clouds are appearing. Some of the uh, private payers are saying, well, maybe we're not gonna cover this 100% anymore. But I think we really have to make efforts in that arena to say, look, we're gonna take a hit for this. We're gonna get five cents on the dollar at the end of the day for virtual monitoring. We'll figure it out. We'll do what's best for our patients. We have to perpetuate virtual follow-up. I'm not going to give you the solution to that, but I know we have to do it. All right. So although CMS covers adults, many of the regulations spill into the pediatric population. Was there any consideration to deal with ventilator-dependent children differently in the expert panel? This is, a, this is a recent problem that's popped up that some of the big carriers are saying, for instance, for oxygen, for pediatric population, well, we think maybe you should meet the pediatric criteria. Before, you couldn't touch kids. You really want to deny a kid this particular benefit? So they were sacrosanct. Well, now, not so. And I'll, I'll admit, I have not been uh, as knowledgeable in the pediatric arena. The rules are different 
So I'm sorry to say, although I, I am sympathetic, we are not the experts in the pediatric group, but I think the CHEST Health Policy and Advocacy Committee can be sensitive to this and rally the pediatric experts to do a similar kind of thing. So don't give up yet, but it will be another group that carries your banner. And so another question for COVID patients, can we get non-invasive ventilation as an exception under PrEP Act? You're gonna to have to meet the criteria. The COVID-19 patients um, actually oftentimes don't have as much of a ventilatory problem as they have an oxygenation problem. I'd be asking whether you could someday uh, find a way to take a high flow nasal cannula home for the COVID patients. Maybe you get them home sooner, but typically they won't need a non-invasive device. And then there's the complication of the aerosol generation. Uh, NIV for the home isn't ready for prime time for COVID. Maybe oxygenation is with a mask on. There, there are ways to think about that, but not for NIV and COVID. All right. And so uh, another question, while we await changes in these guidelines, what can we do as pulmonologists and a society to encourage more responsible utilization of expensive advanced ventilation? Well, quiet prayer is always appropriate, but ultimately um, I think it's gonna solve its own problem. If we make bi-level devices with a backup rate, the appropriate equipment available, then the people who need that will get them. Now that doesn't mean that people out there still don't need home mechanical ventilation. Certainly, it's inarguable that the neuromuscular disease patients are particularly needy. Look, it's a small population. These are not uh, a, such an incredible number that you're going to bankrupt anybody. Oftentimes, their life expectancy is not that uh, great, so that the frequent and substantial servicing won't last beyond three, four, five years. So again, these people deserve to have access to a home mechanical ventilation when they need it but it won't be as prevalent, particularly in the COPD hypercapnic patient, because now we have the right device for the right patient. Um, and also, when will we know about these efforts being successful with CMS? Another million dollar question. Um, I've had conversations with Santa Claus about that, but uh, probably not until early next year. All right, and what do you see are the biggest challenges in moving forward with the committee's recommendations? Medicare is fickle, and I'm prepared to understand that all of our efforts like they have been in the past could go to deaf ears. But I'll, I'll be honest, I can't imagine having a group of technical experts that was in fact urged by Congress that in conversations that we had had personally with, look, CMS is not the enemy. They want to do the right thing. And that all along they said, we just don't understand this. This is too complicated. So unfortunately we made it more complicated. Would you be nice enough to do our work for us? Well, yes, we will. Thank you. And then um, what are your thoughts about home respiratory therapy akin to home physical therapy to teach patients uh, and to engage in longi to engage longitudinal care? Alas, this is, this is mandatory. Patients deserve and need those services with advanced respiratory failure. Unfortunately, the way the system is designed, durable medical equipment is equipment. We'll pay for equipment, but golly gee, we're sorry. We can't pay for any services under DME coverage criteria. So this will have to be another banner. We will have to insist on coverage payment, particularly for respiratory therapists in the home environment. There'll need to be a whole new methodology for us to get coverage for that. It will not be in the durable medical equipment category. It will be in a services home care delivery category, maybe antecedent to physician care. There's a lot of clever ways out there, but it won't be through DME. Um, is there any expected ex acceptance of changes in testing requirements as well, such as utilization of transcutaneous CO2 or end tidal uh, in place of ABGs? On the drawing board, up for request, um, obviously 
some places that have more difficulty getting an arterial blood gas. And let's face it, if a transcutaneous CO2 is 80, the person's hypercapnic. So why wouldn't you use something that simple? We tried several years ago, and it's again, it's a technical expertise problem. They don't understand the issue. So if we can explain it in a way that it's not sounding like fraud and abuse, you just go to your local uh, uh, Walgreens and get a transcutaneous CO2 at a bi-level with a backup rate. No, you do it in an organized fashion. You do it in a way that it even a barrier to appropriate care. I think there's a possibility it might go through. It didn't in the past, but it might now. Um, I there's I think one more here. Rads are much more expensive than standard PAP devices, including ones with backup rates. Will they be proportionally made harder to get? So ultimately, we expect that bi-level devices without a backup rate will be reserved primarily for patients who have tried CPAP and obstructive sleep apnea. They don't really need a backup rate. So that category will still stand, presumptively with less payment. But it's not our job to think about payment. We don't dis determine the actual reimbursement. Our job is to determine the appropriate device for patients. So ultimately, the devices with the backup rate, which will be more expensive, will go to the more specific patients that need that. So there will be different categories. There will be different payments. That's for them to decide. We'll tell them who needs it. Okay. And then can we get emergency use authorization for COPD patients as the numerous devices are being approved with record speed with little clinical data? No. So that was easy. I think we've um, got all of the questions, um, but I do want to read to you some of the uh, other comments. Thank you for being a leader to advocate for millions of patients. Your work will be the, will impact the future of care. Um, so lots of thank yous on here on the chat as well. Um, and so I also want to add my thank you to that um, for all the extraordinary work you've done in advocating for our patients. I, I want to tell you how much this has meant to me. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us in this session. And for uh, those of you who haven't seen it, uh, you can uh, catch it on demand as well.